welcome to part two of our deep dive into a topic that is quite literally the nuts and bolts of the Delta Conveyance Project, and that's the science and technology of tunnel construction. In part one, we learned about the state-of-the-art technology behind tunnel boring machines and the complex process of building large-scale tunnels. Today, we are fortunate to continue our exploration with two experts who understand tunneling in the context of the Delta and what is planned for this project. Joining us today from the Delta Conveyance Design and Construction Authority, also known as the DCA, are the Executive Director, Graham Bradner, and the Chief Engineer, Steve Manassian. Graham has worked as an engineering geologist on major water resources projects in Northern California for over 20 years. He was an integral part of the team that developed the conceptual designs for Delta Conveyance and became Executive Director earlier this year. Steve has over 30 years of national and international experience with mega infrastructure projects, including the Lake Mead Tunnel in Nevada and the Port of Miami Tunnel. Welcome to you both. Thank you, Pat. Nice to be here. Thank you, Pat. Glad to be here. Great. Okay, so in part one, we heard about some of the most visible features of large scale tunnels. Um, the sites of the launch retrieval and maintenance shafts. Graham, let's start with the launch sites. What will they look like for this project? How large are they and how many will there be? Well, Pat, as you mentioned in part one, there is a lot going on at the launch, launch sites. Uh, I'll go through the numbers and sizes first and then Steve will be able to talk us through what they actually look like during construction. Uh, but first, let me pull up a map here that will help us go through the numbers and uh, locations. So the current conceptual designs vary. Uh, they include between two and five launch sites, depending on the corridor and the flow option that we're talking about. Of the proposed alternatives studied in, in the environmental impact report, the smallest number of launch sites would be on the Bethany Reservoir alternative, which follows the, the alignment on the right side, the eastern alignment, and then the, the orange line towards the bottom. The two launch sites for Bethany would be the Twin Cities double launch site, and then Lower Roberts Island would also be a double launch site. Uh, the alternative with the largest number of potential launch sites would be the 7,500 cubic foot per second option, low option, on either the central or eastern corridor. Uh, there would be three, for, for, those, for that configuration, there would be three potential launch sites along the main tunnel north of the southern complex, and then uh, another launch site for the uh, south tunnels connecting the Southern Four Bay to the existing state water project facilities. And then for the 7,500 cubic foot per second option, there would still yet be another small tunnel connecting from the state water project facilities over to the Central Valley project, to the federal project. But again, that's to, to reiterate that last connection would only be for a 7,500 CFS alternative. Uh, for 6,000, it's four launch sites on Central and East. So the size of the launch sites would vary uh, over several hundred acres typically, uh, largely dependent on whether the, it's a dual launch site or a single launch site. Um, a dual launch site meaning there's tunnels driving in both directions from that launch site. A lot of the size of the launch sites is driven by the amount of reusable tunnel material that's being generated, which significantly affects the size and number of uh, the size of the area that's required for managing and stockpiling that material. Uh, but I think now let's, let's let Steve talk us through what's going on at these sites and what they actually look like. Thanks, Graham. So this is a typical launch site where the excavated material is coming out of the uh, tunnel boring machine. It's coming through the um, tunnel. It goes up the shaft and through conveyors. And while the material is going out from the shaft into the stockpile, the precast concrete segments that you see in the background are being loaded into uh, special carriers and they go, they're uh, lowered into the bottom of the shaft. And as this occurs, the um, tunnel boring machine is excavating the material at the same time as the material is coming out, the precast concrete segments are going down the shaft. It's a very busy place. There's other things going on. Uh, such as personnel uh, going in and out of the shaft into the tunnel and other supplies such as uh, utility pipes, uh, 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 other materials that is needed for the tunneling operation. 
as Graham mentioned earlier, uh, there will be a launch site, launch shaft at each site where the tunnel boring machine will be lowered and launched. Along the reach, along each alignment, there will be maintenance shafts approximately four to five miles apart. And at the tail end of the drive of the reach will be a, a retrieval shaft. This is where the tunnel boring machine will be disassembled and hoisted up and hauled away. The maintenance shafts are primarily to stop the machine for a few days or a couple of weeks and check the machine where we cannot do it underground. So we do it through these maintenance shafts, do the proper maintenance in a shaft, and then continue to move on. The retrieval shaft is where we actually take out the machine altogether and we're done with the tunneling operation. And these shafts are typically much smaller than a launch shaft. For example, a launch shaft would be 120 feet in diameter, where the maintenance shaft could be 50 and the retrieval shaft could be about 70. How will the shaft sites be accessed during and after construction? Well, uh, that's a significant consideration. Uh, it's a big part of the project and it's probably a topic that, that could be worthy of a whole separate discussion. Uh, in fact, it was so critical to us, it was a key consideration in the initial siting of the shaft sites during uh, the beginning phases of, of the conceptual design. But just to summarize, the, the sites would be largely accessed by railroad and roadway. As you heard from Steve, the maintenance and reception shafts have a lot less going on such that construction and maintenance activities could be supported entirely by roads. Although many of the existing roads and bridges would still need to be modified or upgraded to support the construction traffic. We're also trying to use dedicated haul roads where possible, haul routes uh, to avoid, and as well as avoiding use of existing levee crown roads. All of this is to lessen the, the potential construction impacts on existing roads. For the launch sites, we're also including a railroad connection. Uh, the railroad connections used for movement of bulk materials, supplies, uh, in and out of the sites, again, with the objective of decreasing or lessening the construction effects on all the local roads. Okay. So how big will the shaft site footprints be once the project is completed? And what will the final facilities look like? Well, so let's use the Twin Cities complex as an example site. Uh, the yellow boundary shown on this figure is the temporary construction boundary, whereas the red boundary is the permanent footprint. And the, the size of that red boundary and even the yellow boundary, it does vary by, by a project alternative. But we'll just use this, as a, this one as an example to kind of set up the, uh, the, the, the render here. So the conceptual designs do include restoration of all the shaft sites following construction to remove all of the construction equipment, materials. Uh, these big construction sites like Twin Cities would have uh, grading of the site, planting of grasses or other native vegetation. And so here I've got a couple other images that I want to show you. So this is a rendering of the Twin Cities complex after construction. So all that would be left would be the, the tunnel shaft pad there kind of in the foreground. Uh, that is, I'll remind you, a dual launch shaft. So you see the two concentric shafts there connected together. So there's the elevated pad on the order of maybe five or 10 acres a footprint there with the pad. And then there's the RTM stockpile that's there in the background that's all seeded and, and vegetated and stabilized for erosion. Uh, we also have maintenance and reception shafts. And so here I've got another render that, that we can look at as a, as a typical site condition. Um, all the sites, in addition, not just the launch shaft sites, but the maintenance and reception shafts would have a shaft pad, you know, like I said, maybe a five to 10 acre shaft pad there that would be seated along the side slopes with native grasses. Uh, the mound itself would be anywhere from 10 to 20 feet above ex existing grade and would have that upper concrete shaft sticking up another 10 to 15 feet above the top of the shaft pad. There would also be material that was excavated from the shaft, uh, stockpiled around the site. So you can see uh, sort of in that upside down L shape there along the left and top would be the, the low stockpile of material excavated from the shaft during construction that would also be seeded with grasses and stabilized so that it's, uh, it's covered and, and permanent there. But other than that, it's just parking areas, stormwater features, and uh, you know, relatively low security fence around the site just to protect all of the infrastructure. Very helpful, thank you.
So now let's talk about all the material that will be excavated by the tunnel boring machine. With a tunnel of this size, there's obviously going to be a tremendous amount of it. So how much of it will there be and how will it be handled? I'll cover that, Pat. So depending on the uh, flow rates we design for and the alignments we use, the total amount of excavated material coming from all the tunnels will be in the range of six to 15 million cubic yards. That's quite a bit of material. The material will be excavated with, by the TBMs, come to the shaft on a conveyor, then go up the shaft via vertical conveyor that convey to the stockpile area. At that point, the material will be tested to make sure it's not contaminated if it is contaminated, it will be set aside and, and dealt with appropriately. The non-contaminated material will be stockpiled. And when we need it for uh, certain areas to reuse it, it'll be dewatered or dried out so that we can use it. The material that is not uh, to be used uh, at that time will be stockpiled and let, dry, let it dry out in due time. And what will the material actually contain? The material will be mostly ground, soil, which is sand, silt, and gravel. And with a little bit of addition of uh, conditioning uh, devices, which is biodegradable, environmental friendly. And we will make sure we specify that in our contract documents that the contractors do use biodegradable, environmental friendly materials and water. You know, most of the water will be uh, groundwater that the, the ground, the, the soil is saturated with. So the material as it comes out will be relatively wet. Think of it as toothpaste cons consistency, which if we need it in the immediate uh, future, we will have to dry it out. And what could the material be used for? Well, I'll let Graham uh, talk about that. Thanks, Steve. Um, so, Pat, we have done a lot of work on this issue. Uh, first of all, this project were to be built, as you heard earlier, access and logistics are really a key consideration. One of the bigger issues is hauling in the various fill materials to the various sites that are needed for construction or, or off hauling for disposal. So we started out in this uh, conceptual design phase by performing a project-wide soil materials balance. And so we did that to figure out when and where material would be generated through excavation, through tunneling, versus where it would be needed uh, to sequence the construction activities and make the most use of all the on-site materials that we'll be generating, rather than having to haul all of that material into the project sites from outside sources. So we've studied the samples collected from tunnel depth for subsurface investigation. Those materials have been mixed with tunneling conditioners that Steve described. And we've concluded that the material will be reusable as structural fill, as embankment fill, as, as a structural soil um, filled material. It meets state and federal requirements for embankment construction. And we do intend to use a pretty large portion of that RTM for construction of the Southern Floor Bay. Bear in mind that's only for central and Eastern corridor alternatives. Uh, but even after all of the project reuse, there would still likely be several million cubic yards of RTM left over that certainly could be used for other nearby projects, such as levy improvements or habitat projects. And where would this material be stored? The excess unused RTM would be stockpiled at the tunnel launch sites. So you saw on the render before the, the stockpiled areas that were then seeded and covered, uh, covered with grass. So the material would be stockpiled at the tunnel launch sites uh, as, a, as a permanent location, but then of course would, would be available for future uses. So let's turn to the tunnel boring machines, TBMs, and reaches now. So for a project of this size, of course there are multiple contractors involved. How many TBMs would you expect to have running at the same time? And what's the estimated length of each section of tunnel? So, um... The minimum number of TBMs we will have on the project will be four. That will be for the Bethany alternative. Uh, the maximum we will have will be six, which will be for the Eastern or Central in, and using the 7,500 CFS flow rate. 
more than likely we'll have four or five because we will more than likely have the 6,000 CFS rate. Uh, but each TBM will be launched at different launch site and it'll be launched at different times. So depending on the length of the reach, for example, some of the reaches are 12 miles, some of them are 14 miles. These are on a critical path. So we'll launch these first uh, to make sure we don't uh, uh, delay the project. Then the other TBM reaches, which are eight miles, they will be launched later. So there will be simultaneous excavation of these TBMs, but at the same time, they will they will be completely independent uh, projects and, and most likely different contractors. And these are, uh, it's all planned out as uh, Graham mentioned earlier, how to handle the material, the reusable tunnel material, the segments and all that, the logistics. Graham, anything else you'd like to add? Well, I think it's worth emphasizing, Steve, that again, I know we've talked about the construction activities that are taking place at these launch sites, but it, it is significant, the amount of work that's that's happening at these launch sites, so much so that it's uh, we've looked at the various combinations that Steve was des describing, and we've definitely determined that it's beneficial to have as few a launch sites as possible and have some of these longer tunnel drives. You know, one thing I want to mention, something like this is not unprecedented. For example, years ago, I worked in the Middle East uh, and we were working on the Doha Metro in Doha, Qatar. And they had a very aggressive schedule to build the Metro. And at one given point in time, I think we had approximately eight or nine tunnel boring machines excavating at the same time. So having four, five or six is not unusual. What is unusual here is the, the size of these machines because they're more 40 foot diameter versus a typical metro tunnel is closer to a 22 or 23 foot in diameter. So Steve, since you do have so much personal experience um, working with TBMs, I wanted to ask you, what's it like inside one of these machines and how are they kept watertight? That's a very good question, Pat. So I've spent a lot of time in my 35 plus year career in the tunnels. And I, when I go in a tunnel near the machine, I actually feel like I'm at home, <laughs> more, more at home than I am at home. At the, the, when you get to the heading, which is where the work is ongoing, where the tunnel boring machine is, it's very exciting. There's a lot of activity. On one hand, the machine is excavating the material. You see, you, you feel the machine, you hear it underground. And, and these machines are very powerful. So something this size is probably close to uh, 20,000 uh, horsepower. So you, you get a lot of power, but it's doing physical work, which is excavating the material. You see the material coming out of the conveyors. Then once the machine push makes its stroke, which is usually five or six feet, then it stops. Then you build the next ring, which, uh, which is what the precast concrete segments are. So. The reason it's watertight, the machine itself is watertight against the ground and the soil. And as you're installing the segments right behind the tail shield, you have three and sometimes four sets of tail seal br brushes. And in these brushes, there is a biodegradable material pumped in. So the water and the fines don't come into the tunnel. And once the ring is built, the rings themselves, there's usually seven or eight pieces, something this size. They have bolted gasketed segments and the gaskets are designed to keep the water and the fines out. So the, the tunnel that's behind us is dry. Uh, uh, you don't see any water coming in. You may see occasional seeps or maybe just a drip, drip of water here and there, but for the most part, 99.9% .9 of it is dry. And well, we've done things like this under large bodies of water you know, underneath the oceans, rivers, lakes, for example, Lake Mead, Port of Miami Tunnel, very similar conditions uh, where we will cross some of these levees and so forth, water bodies. It's, it's not a problem. It's not an issue at all. Well, I'd like to thank you both very much for taking time out of your busy schedules today to talk to us about what construction of the Delta Conveyance Project Tunnel would look like. It's been such an interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for our viewers, of course, there's still a lot more Delta conveyance topics to cover. So we hope you'll join us again next time. Thanks for watching.